Well, when I was 16, I was reading a book on yogic philosophy. I've got a facsimile in my case there. And in that book, the yogis said that atoms are vortices of energy. They said that the smallest particles of matter are vortices. They use the word prana. And that book was published in the year 1904. And Albert Einstein published his theory of relativity, his equation relating mass and energy equals mc squared. He published that in 1905. And I realized that if the yogis could anticipate Einstein, then maybe they have the secret, the key to the universe. So what I did is I sp spent the last 50 years working on this idea that the subatomic particles are vortices of energy, the electrons, the protons, the neutrons. And in my book, The Vortex Theory, if you have that book, you'll see my challenge to quantum mechanics and quark theory. I use the neutron to crash quantum mechanics and the proton to crash the quark theory. There are no quarks. There are no virtual particles. Um, quantum mechanics, as Einstein said, is a real which is calculus, so ingenious in its complexity as to be impossible to prove wrong. But actually a particle was discovered after they had elbowed Einstein out of physics. That particle is called the neutron. And that neutron, the particle that is used by physicists to detonate weapons of mass destruction, is the particle that's the nemesis of quantum mechanics. The whole lot's going to be exploded. So it's like a divine retribution. Everything that is being taught in the universities in physics is wrong. Physics is the king of sciences. If physics crashes, takes the whole of science with it. We're in interesting times. And what are we left with? Well, what I'm going to show you tonight is there is more, this is my battle cry, there is more reason to believe in angels and fairies than in quarks, the virtual particles of quantum mechanics. And I'm being serious. You see, these mystics whose scientists have spoken of as pathological cases, the mystics used their city powers, these yogis, and they took their consciousness into the atom. And they saw that the atom has a lot in common with Tony Blair. There's nothing in there but spin. <laughs> so, the idea is that energy, whatever it is, is spinning, and because it's free to spin, like so, there's nothing to stop it going in every direction. It's changing direction the whole time, and you end up with the ball vortex, like the ball of wool. And it's interesting, Granny is being sewing and knitting, I do, the, I do the sewing, Granny does the knitting, for generations, and all the time, you know, oh, she's just Granny. She's just a woman, you see. The physicists are men. And they didn't bother to look at Granny with her knitting. They didn't realise she had the key to the universe in her hands the whole time. And the thing about this form of energy is it's the feminine form of energy. Because it's the basis of matter, which is meta, the mother. And this is like the ovum. It's spherical, it's receptive. And chemistry, which is based on atoms interacting, which are based on these vortices spinning around each other, is the feminine, the divine mother aspect of physics. It's going to be very difficult, different physics in the future. Physics is, it, it, is like the father role in the Trinity. Chemistry is like the mother. And then chemistry and physics coming together make the baby, the child, the biology is the third person of the scientific trinity. So, why can we ascribe the trinity to science? Well, it's this. This form of energy, 
that has been overlooked. They try to explain the whole of physics in terms of waves, which is the masculine form of energy, like sperm. We see the way, not the world, not the way it is, but the way we are. Men just see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Where's God the mother? Where's God the daughter? In physics, it's waves, because that's the masculine form. Where's the feminine form of energy? That's why at these talks, when I give them, there are always more women than men. Why are women attracted to my talks? Because I've got the feminine form of energy here. And what this form does, it explains away all the properties of material. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about the soul. I'm going to talk about near-death experience. I'm going to talk about the continuity of consciousness. And Pythagoras spoke about it. And Plato said that the psyche comes in and is a template for the physical body, and then the psyche leaves when we die. But Democritus, who Plato deplored, said that only atoms in a void of space exist, everything else is opinion, and Plato's famous student, Aristotle, instead of following Plato, he followed Democritus. And the whole of our physics is based on, on Democritus and Aristotle. Science is based on them, and they are wrong. Democritus was vehemently opposed to the soul and spirit. He was the father of materialism. And it took one man to shatter his worldview, and that man was Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein showed that mass and space-time are relative to the speed of light. So what do I mean by relative to the speed of light? Well, it's this. The vortex explains away all the properties of material, the extension and three-dimensional. That's the vortex. It's a three-dimensional spiral. The inertia of mass. That's because it's little gyroscopes spinning, creating inertia. You see? Force fields we can explain in terms of the extension of vortex energy. Space is the vortex energy beyond our perception. Gravity can be explained by the vortex. Magnetism, electricity. The whole of physics can be explained by the vortex, the wave working together. You see, wave particle duality is subatomic sex. What happens is the waveform drives into the vortex form and pushes it forward in wave emotion. Wave particle duality. Simple. We can ex we've got a new quantum theory. We don't need quantum mechanics. It's all based on subatomic sex. And I tell you, the students are going to be a lot more interested in that one. <laughs> so, Susie and I, we have talks. We go, we talk, we, we talk about this stuff. Susie really gets her mind around this physics. And anyway, what Susie was saying, she finds really difficult to comprehend, is how in this, what we perceive to be so solid, this the basic form of matter, the subatomic particle, there's nothing there. There's nothing moving. And this is the biggest problem I have with everybody. Because people can't find it really hard to get. What I've explained away is the Democritus idea. Something exists and then it moves. And in religion you get the same materialism. God exists and then creates. You assume the existence of something and then it acts. And energy is its action. And Einstein came along and said, no, you get the action first. And that creates everything. The action makes everything. And that's what Buddha taught. That's what they teach in the East, the dynamic principle. The universe is the dance of Shiva. It's not Shiva dancing, it's his dance. There's nothing in there but dance. But there's nothing dancing. Read The Turning Point by Fitrov Capra. Or Tao Physics. <coughs> so
So this is what we're doing. We're blowing away materialism and bringing in a very powerful idea. And that is, these particles of energy that make up our world are more like thoughts than things. They're particles of abstraction. They're bits of dream. There's nothing there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the dream time. We're in it. We're in a dream. People on near-death experiences, they say, that's the real world. When they leave this world, it just fades like a dream. It seems so real. It seems so solid. But it's an illusion. The illusion of Maya. They knew it all. These yogis knew it. The, the Indians, they know it. The Chinese out there in the East, they've got it. So, where does that lead us? Well, if our world is formed out of particles of movement at the speed of light, maybe there are other worlds formed out of particles of movement faster than the speed of light. But before I talk about the realms of super energy and use them to explain spirit and soul and life after death and reincarnation and near death experiences, I just want to talk about God. Because at the age of four, I declared I was going to prove the existence of God through science. And that's a bit of um, uh, what do you call it with the children? A, a pre precocious, a bit of a precocious statement by a four-year-old. You can't prove anything, let alone God. But what we can show is that if particles of energy are thought forms, then the universe is a mind. And this is where quantum physics is, is leading. The quantum physicists recognize that the bedrock of reality is consciousness. This vortex, the energy in this vortex, is an act of consciousness, not an act of material substance. And what is that universal consciousness that imagines everything into existence? What is that universal mind of which galaxies and clusters of galaxies, the whole universe is this immense unfolding dream. You know what the universe is in this mind? When you look out at the terrace telescope and you look at those stars, you're looking at memory. The thoughts of the light, this is the memory. The vortex is the basis of memory. And so here we are with our mind incarnations of mind. So what is the mind? Where do we come from? Why have I called this talk the womb of angels? Well, what I suggest is this. What Einstein was saying when he said everything is relative to the speed of light is that our world is formed out of particles of movement at the speed of light. And then you get another world formed out of twice the speed of light. I call it the extra physical. And then you get another level, which is 16 times the speed of light, which I call the super physical. So those are three basic levels to the universe of energy. And the universe is just like the atom. In the atom, we have the quantum states. I don't know whether you remember when you were doing, you know, at school, you were doing the atom, how you get electrons are at a certain energy level, then there's nothing in between, and then they leap to another level. There's a quantum leap. So they're definite levels. The, the, in quantum theory, as in evolutionary theory, things go in steps. They don't go gradually. They change suddenly. So it's like that in the universe. You get a critical speed that makes up a world, and then you get another one, and then you get another one, 
Okay? So, if movement, and that is what energy means, the movement within, <coughs> if movement is the basis of reality, then there's a very simple law that I'm going to apply. It's a self-evident law. And I'm going to use this law to explain the spiritual and the supernatural. Slow speeds are part of faster speeds. But fast speeds are not part of slow speeds. Now let me explain myself. A jet can go at walking speed, a jet can go at bicycle speed, a jet can go at car speed, and a jet can go at jet speed. But you can't catch a jet taking off down the runway on your bicycle. You see, when the jet just moves off, when you're in, the, you know, you've all experienced this, it just moves away from the terminal, you just feel that gentle motion. And then it's going at walking speed. You know, you've all experienced it. And then it's just moving toward the runway at, at the sort of, you know, faster than you can run. So this is the law of speed subsets. Means, subset means a part of. And that is, the worlds based upon slower speeds are part of the worlds based upon faster speeds. And the model for the universe is this. Concentric spheres. That is our world based on the speed of light, which in the New Age movement is called the third dimension. That is the level based on twice the speed of light, which in the New Age movement is called the fourth dimension. That is the level based upon 16 times the speed of light, which in the New Age movement is called the fifth dimension. Now, I don't like that use of the word dimension because I prefer to go back to Hermes, who first came up with this model. By the way, he was taught this model by none other than Pamandras. Do you know who Pamandras was? The shepherd of mankind. The good shepherd. The Word, the Logos that became flesh a thousand years ago is responsible for our medicine, is responsible for science. All this understanding of the universe comes from that same source. Makes you think. Anyway, there you've got the three levels. What Hermes was teaching, what he was taught by the Pamandras, and the Pamandras gave, the shepherd of mankind gave Hermes, our name, which means the human being, hu meaning the divine, so that with, with the being that brings together the divine and the material. He used the word planes or levels, because you've got all the dimensions in, on that plane, all the dimensions on that plane, all the dimensions on that plane. Okay. So, what it is, is in that world, you've got the physical world we live in. In this world, we can't see this world, but this world contains our physical world. Now, because of Einstein's theory of relativity, we realize that the space-time is different in each world. So, a, a, a body in our world can coincide in the same here and now as a body in another world. They can overlay each other. This is a very important point. So, whatever there is in our world, there is in the other world. Because our world is part of the other world. If there are bodies in this world, there can be bodies in the other world. Only the speed of the energy is different. If we were to accelerate the speed of energy in every vortex of your body, you would descend out of physical space and time, pop up in another reality. Beam me up, Scotty. So in the 90s, I was traveling the world using this physics to explain the ascension <coughs> predictions. But I'm now using the physics, and I've come out of the woodwork again, to explain 
death experiences, after death experiences, actual death experiences, not near death experiences. The people who go through these experiences have died. No sign of life. They've gone through cardiac arrest, the brain has stopped, all organs have failed, and there's no respiration. And this is the new technology in medicine. They can bring someone back, they can resuscitate someone after they've been dead for 48 hours. Amazing stuff's going on. Half the hospitals in Europe and America have the technology, have the equipment. I had a heart operation. I had a valve go. And I collapsed two days after the operation. When I came round minutes later, there was a team of people in front of me. Someone was cradling me in his arms and was directing the operation. They were wiring me up and they were putting all sorts of things on me. They were moving like a well-oiled machine. Down at Derriford, they don't lose any of their cardiac patients, I tell you. They were prepared to bring me back at my heart stopped. So, these teams are bringing people back from the dead and the number of people that have been brought back now number in the millions. And what they're doing now is they're interviewing them. Did you have any experiences whilst you were away? They're collecting data. They're taking it very seriously. Science is dividing now between those who are following the lights of Richard Dawkins and those who are saying, hang on a sec, we've got something going on here. You see, ladies and gentlemen, for over 2,000, maybe 3,000 years, the Western religions, based upon the Judaic Judaism, moving into Islam and Christianity, those three religions made, put forward a hypothesis. They said a day will come when people will rise from the dead and walk again amongst us. I was brought up as a Catholic. We were told they'd be teaching us all about heaven and hell. We thought the graves would open. It's called the resurrection. The Pomandras, Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, the story goes, I learnt it, you know, he, he descended into hell and rose again on the third day or something like that. He descended into hell and then he came up again. He came back to life. This is the resurrection. Now, what is happening now is that people are being raised from the dead and they're walking again amongst us and they're talking about heaven and hell. Only it's not a miracle wrought by God. It's a miracle wrought by modern medicine. So, that means that the hypothesis put forward by religion now becomes a full-blown scientific theory. You can no longer rubbish religion in the name of science and call yourself a scientist. You demean science if you do so. There's a rule in science. If someone can make a prediction and it's tested by observation and validated, it's a valid theory. It's believable. We're in an awesome time now, amazing time. So what's going on with these death experiences? What are these people saying? First of all, they are not hallucinating. It's not the hallucination of a dying brain because as a chap called Sampania, writing in a book called Erasing Death says, he says, I don't start work. He's a uh, critical care doctor. I don't start work on the patient until they're dead. But we don't get them till they're dead. They come in dead. Clinically dead. So the divide between science and religion is just melting. And this is why the vortex theory is so important, because we can explain exactly what's happened. What I propose is that you're all 
You've grown. You're all grown ups now, <laughs> apart from Peter somewhere. There's Peter here. He's 14, so he's, he's still got a bit of growth to go. <laughs> he's gone back. The, Peter is still growing a second body, but all of you have grown a, a second body. You don't realize that you've got two bodies. It's called the two body dilemma. The second body that you've got belongs to this extra physical realm. It's made of matter, but the energy inside those particles is twice the speed of light. But it's there, and it's much more like an electromagnetic field, like a matrix. Now, some of you might have read The Field by Lynn McTaggart, or read Harold Saxton Burr, you know, Curlian photography and all that, the electromagnetic fields of life. Okay. People are reporting that they step out of their body. They, they see their physical body in the accident or on the hospital bed. And they step out in another body. Only the other body, and, you know, they can clench their fists. They can, it's got a heart beating. It's got skin. They've got eyes. They can see. They can hear only far more clearly. It's almost as though this body is like a spacesuit that damps them down. They say the world out there is much more real, but they can still see this world really vividly. You know, they could feel the linoleum under the feet. They can smell all the smells. They see the sights. They have these out-of-body experiences where they have a vivid picture. There's a lovely story of a chap who um, had been resuscitated. And he went up to this nurse in the hospital. This was a couple of weeks after he'd been resuscitated. He said, oh, he said, you're the nurse who took out my false teeth and put them in the tray at the bottom. You know how they have these surgical trays. This nurse had been trying to get a ventilator down his throat and his teeth were in the way. So he pulled his teeth out and threw them in the bottom and got the ventilator down. He'd never met her before. She wasn't usually in the wards. She was a theatre nurse. And it's like... You know, how did that happen? So, what I'm suggesting is <coughs> that this life body that is formed, that, th that is resonating with the physical body, it resonates with the DNA molecule, carries the life, it carries the mind. And this Physical body is just like a suit of clothing. It's just like a vehicle which enables the life body to operate in a gravitational field in atomic matter. 99.9% .9 of the universe is plasma, which is just electrons, protons, neutrons, not organized into matter. It's the best thing for life because life's based on electricity, much better than atomic matter. Atomic matter is the worst thing for life. We're not the beginning of life, we're the end point of life. Space is full of life. Low density, invisible life. Space is alive. The universe is, is alive. And it's like the biggest challenge is, you know, can we project ourselves into that dust, into that atomic matter? The only way these plasmic life beings could do that was to use water because water's the nearest thing to plasma. And so what it is, is you've got a little drop of water dissolved in protein to form a cell and it conducts the electricity of life. And it's held up on sticks of, sticks of stone which we call bone. Okay. So what are we here for? Why? If we've got these beautiful bodies that separate from us when we go through what we call death, which isn't, it isn't, that death isn't even real, it's a delusion. It's because we're here to learn to become angels. I reckon we're gestating angels. And I got this idea from Swedenborg, Emmanuel Swedenborg, who was taught in his visions that 
angels are not created in heaven by God. Angels arise out of the souls of humans deceased. So, the model I'm working with is that we come down here to a boot camp to go through challenges. And on this level, the dark and the light are mixed. So we have the choice. We're here to choose. We're here to go through difficulty, challenge and adversity. We're in training to become managers in the universe. Professor Sir Fred Hoyle, one of Britain's greatest cosmologists, in a book he wrote called The Intelligent Universe, said the universe is basically intelligent. And he didn't like the idea of God creating the universe. He liked the Greek-Roman idea of the universe existing and the gods are managers within the existing universe. And I like that idea, the angels like the managers of the universe. And when you track it down, the God of the Old Testament was an angel. If you read the Bible carefully around the time of, of Abraham and uh, you know, going up the mountain to sacrifice his son, God <coughs> speaks, the angel is there, and the angel speaks as God. So the thing is that you've got this universal consciousness, but it individualizes into these plasmic space beings that we call angels, the messengers. And they're projecting themselves into physical incarnations, either to upgrade themselves, or, and I think, to make new plasmic beings, new angels. So, the model I've got is that this plasmic angel seeds the incarnation. So you've got Michael the Archangel seeding in the incarnation that became Jesus Christ. Because he's an incarnation of Michael the Archangel according to the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, and I go along with that as well. So he's seeded and then through his life he went through a process of where it, the story goes, I mean is very likely his mother was raped, okay? So he was illegitimate. He despised the Romans. He was a zealot. But then he must have gone through, I bet he was out there, you know, a bit, bit like Nelson Mandela, blowing up the things, you know what I mean? And, and then he changed. He realized that love is the way. So he must have gone through some sort of change some, and became a great healer and a great teacher. But then he blew it. He went in, he gave way to anger and turned over the bankers' tables in the temples. So the, the elders shocked him to, to the Romans, saying, hey, we've got a zealot here. But that's the only reason why Pilate would have crucified him if, if he was a zealot. But on his cross he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then he descended into hell, but because of that forgiveness he was lifted up into heaven. And there are these amazing stories I've, I've got in my, my book, Continuous Living, of this man, Howard Storm. You look at him on the internet. Follow up Howard Storm on the internet. The Focus interview. Okay? And really worth looking at. Another one is Ian McCormick. But what I'm trying to do in my work is make what these men are teaching available to people who are not Christians. They were, they were, Howard Storm was an atheist professor of art in America. He had a perforated duodenum. And he died. And his, body, his life body separated from the physical, but he was taken into hell. But 13 years before his death experience, a nun had come into his class. And he said to the nun, look, I don't mind having you in my class, but I'm an atheist, and I don't want you telling, talking your religion to these other people. So she agreed, fine. But when she went home to her congregation, she and the other nuns started praying for Howard Storm. They prayed for this guy every day for 13 years. And what happened is that a voice in his head called on him to pray. He didn't even know how to pray, but he made a real effort to pray, and he was actually rescued. He was lifted out of hell. So he went through in his near-death experience, or after-death experience, the same, ex exactly the same thing that Christ went through. And that's what's so amazing, is that the resurrection is happening exactly as, 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 as predicted. 
But it seems as though people choose from their, either they choose love or hate, cruelty or kindness, um, you know, pride or humility, but people choose their polarity. And in this second level, they go into the space that's most appropriate to their choices, which is either heaven or hell. This is what the information is coming back. And what I'm actually teaching is that the ascension process, I'm saying that this, this process that they're going through is not ascension, because it, the life body is already there, based on twice the speed of light. It's just a separation. So the real body is the life body, which then, if you like, integrates. You learn the consequences of your choices, the consequences of your behavior are on this level. You really integrate, because that's part of your training. And each life body is a soul fragment. But what you are as a soul is you're an individualized mind. And it's that mind that is coming back again and again. It's your mind that reincarnates. When you die, or go through the passage we call death, you don't just get away from yourself. You take you with you. <coughs> you take your mind with you. All your thoughts, all your beliefs, all your attitudes. You find yourself with other people of that disposition. You can all work it out together. But then, and then, when it comes to the ascension at the end of the age, all those soul fragments belonging to that mind are collected up. Every experience on earth, in heaven or hell, is of value to the new angel that's birthed at the time of ascension. So when you've got thoughts going on in your mind, a lot of those thoughts aren't you thinking. It's other soul fragments that share the same mind. It's not the thoughts that count, it's what you do with them that matters. So again, there are a lot of very radical ideas coming out at this time. And the only thing, what, what these people coming back from the near-death experience, the only thing that matters is the love that we share. Nothing else really matters in life apart from <coughs> sharing love with whoever we can. So, thank you very much for coming, and I'll open up for questions.